he is. Okay. Good. <clears throat> I think we're uh, probably ready to get into this a little bit. I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, the SIRC Wednesday evening lecture. And this evening with us is Andre Goes of West 8. And I'd also uh, like to acknowledge and thank you very much to the Consulate of the Netherlands, who has in part made his visit possible with us. Um, Andre is a landscape architect and a professor at the Academy voor Baukunst in Amsterdam. While his profession is a very familiar one to us, probably particularly in Los Angeles, he kind of enters into it with a kind of giant side leap. His interests appear to locate kind of impossible sort of circumstances to launch what I would at least call full throttle in the midst of suburban and kind of urban landscapes. Andre's sites somehow describe places with multiple trajectories, which oscillate between many fictions and constantly needing to adapt to the dynamics of rather shifting grounds. He appears to be fascinated by the unnotorious, the unedited, and the raw, maybe even the banal, which are constantly revised and revisited in the landscapes within which he operates. He takes on full throttle the possibilities of fringe areas within the city. In a sense, his work can be read as a set of landscape corrections, which prompt or nudge problems of a critical landscape kind to the foreground of sites as experienced and constructed places. Andre launches, launches an assault on staid and established notions of gardens and landscapes as we perhaps know them best. His work draws from and blurs the boundary between political, social, cultural, and individual sites, taking them all on, all at once, in all of their layers. Perhaps the mechanism amongst all of them, which he might be using as far as I was able to tell, uh, to reconcile and to weave these multiple stories together are his enthusiasm and trust in the physicality of making. For example, gravel, wood, and leaves for a building complex in Rotterdam, stainless steel electricity cabinets, lighting masts, and anti-park rails for a market square and a proposal for 20 million cubic meters of garbage as a footing for a leisure facility. Andre Goes is unplugged. Please welcome Andre Goes. So first we start a period of testing and a sort of 30 seconds to start cameras. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for this uh, introduction. Um, it's an honor for me to be in uh, LA. I like this city very much and uh, it's a very nice uh, occasion to to see this school for the first time. I'm quite impressed about the uh, uh, laboratory atmosphere down here. So I would love to have uh, a closer view to the studios. Um, this is a picture to start with. I'm a landscape architect. I'm not an architect. I'm not an artist, I'm a landscape architect. Um, you might say a gardener. 
This microphone is provoking me. Can it be more down? Yeah? Okay. Um, I'm used to be close to my wife, but not to this kind of electronics. Um, so this is uh, the early uh, and young Adrian Geuze. Um, I, w I wanted to start with uh, this slide to explain you what a polder is. I'm from the Netherlands. Uh, half of our country is below sea level. And uh, most of the Americans don't know what a polder is. And I, I had an idea, well, this is a good occasion to tell you about it. So we start in the sea and build a dike. That's the diagonal. Then we put a pump station uh, on the dike. Uh, we, we excavate some ditches. That, that, those are the blue lines. And then we start pumping. Here's the pump house, the ditches. And then we create a new area below sea level. And that's a polder. Originally, they used windmills for that. So, my grandfather, he was a dike engineer, and he's, he gave me the interest in the making landscape. Um, this is how it works. This is diesel, f fuel. This is the pump house. Machinery inside, sucking the water all day. And those are the canals behind the pump house. And the polar here is on the bottom of the former sea level. And then you see trees start to grow. Farmers and even cows. So this is a polar. <coughs> this is about Holland. Um, maybe it's important because I, uh, I will finish with a project sort of dedicated to Holland. Uh, so you know a little bit about our landscape. Um, the first project, because I don't, uh, I don't have a, s a sort of story or a statement, I just show some project. I think it's nice for students to recognize uh, our work and uh, maybe we can discuss a few things. Um, the first project to be shown is the Schiphol uh, Airport, which is our international airport, uh, which is quite booming airport uh, since 10 years. Um, and the, the, the airport authorities, they, they were quite concerned about uh, the image of the airport. As you, as you might see, it looks a little bit as all the international airports. It's a, it's a, it's a world of asphalt and concrete and building sites. Um, and the Schiphol, they are very concerned normally uh, for their identity because since many years they win prizes as the best airport in the world, things like that. Uh, and they want to have a green airport. And because of the extensions, uh, that identity was lost. So we got a commission to make a greener airport. Um, we did some research, discovered uh, what you already might know uh, on, on an airport uh, ter terrain. Uh, the, the free space, the wasteland, uh, so-called wasteland, is only a fragmented uh, area, fragmented pieces. Uh, it can hardly be seen as, a, as, a, as an area uh, uh, which is a unity. And, uh, we consider the, uh, that as a sort of playing ground for our strategy to make the airport greenery. Uh, for that, we, uh, we made a scenario, printed that. Uh, and uh, to create a greener airport, we first started to remove all the, uh, let's say, the existing green uh, at the center of the, the territory. And this was a sort of shrubs and roses and uh, so-called uh, uh, funny green. You find it everywhere, which is, uh, well, it, it, it is vegetation, but you can hardly recognize it as that. Um, 
And we, we wanted uh, to, to get rid of this uh, uh, romantic uh, uh, roses stuff. Instead of that, we uh, had in mind to, to plant a sort of plantation of birch trees all over the area, e e even on very small spots. Uh, we, we could uh, realize a tree uh, and to, to, to get good results in this polder area which is very close to the sea and which, which had uh, a heavy wind condition we, uh, we did research with the National Institute of Forestry and we discovered that, uh, that the only uh, good way of doing it is planting very young trees and too much trees, let's say uh, real close planted birch trees. And this was for us, a, a, although it might seem a little bit easy, uh, this was the first time we, we, we did this four years ago. We ever made a, a plan without designing. So we, we used the computer to identify each lot which has no function. We even uh, took away a uh, uh, useless tiled, uh, tiled area uh, and uh, we made uh, plantation uh, schemes for each winter to be planted and when you start planting it looks like this very young trees they are this high to get it really green uh, we uh, took clover seeds and uh, with that as a pillow underneath the trees, uh, the, the, the effect was uh, really marvelous. As you might know, uh, clover is a vegetation which brings uh, nutrients from air into the soil. So the, the birch trees uh, grow uh, twice uh, as normal, twice uh, quick as normal. To get the clover uh, over year, because this is a one-year vegetation, um, we ask for uh, bees, and at the moment, uh, all around the airport, you find these boxes uh, with small helicopters taking care for the clover, uh, and so it uh, it it survives. Um, the, the, this, this simple scenario it can be done uh, everywhere, uh, in cargo areas, uh, near parkings, uh, 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 sidewalks, uh, also close to, closer to the terminal. And you see we completely cover every piece which is, has no function, sort of carpeting the airport uh, with this plant, plantage. So beside, this was a sort of, let's say, uh, design uh, like, in a way, like farmers work or people in the, in the forests without design. This was for us also the first design. We uh, didn't uh, deal with bureaucracy because we simply didn't make a, a sort of conversation to, to other authorities, to traffic people, etc. We plant everywhere. And uh, also on cables and pipelines, um, which is absolutely not done uh, normally. And uh, when there, well, a few of the, uh, the municipality uh, um, services start complaining immediately uh, by do, when you do things like this, uh, and we just tell them that they can take away each tree they don't like as a sort of, well, we, we, we are planting a million trees, so if you want to take out hundreds, go ahead. So here you see even in parking, inside the parking garages, open spots are colonized by these birch trees. Um, with this strategy, uh, uh, we already uh, planted half a million trees, so let's say 100,000 a year. 
and uh, we reduced the maintenance budget to a half of what it was. Uh, and with that money, we uh, created uh, bulb fields all over the area, and um, also on air side with red and white tulips. And uh, we could uh, force the authorities to uh, create uh, pots in which we can uh, uh, add the, the, the flowers, vegetation, which you can find in my grandmother's front garden. Really normal, typically Dutch vegetation like tulips and daddies. We change them every two months. Uh, they are really uh, loved by Japanese and American tourists who sit down in those pots and photograph their families. Uh, so this this was a, this is a this is a big uh, project, uh, the Schiphol Airport project. Uh, we are working, uh, continuing working uh, in that project for maybe another five years. Uh, and let's say the main thing is that we the entire area, which is also business parks, parking uh, uh, areas, all kind of service and facility areas. Uh, will be more and more one identity in future. They will form a sort of enclave in the peripheral zone of Amsterdam. Uh, so, and, and since this is um, uh, most of the area is run by uh, private companies, this is the first. This will be also the first private city in Holland. Uh, this is a, a temporary office uh, in barracks. Uh, put on uh, on a former uh, parking lot, an asphalt, and we covered the asphalt with broken pots, terracotta, to have a, a simple garden, a really low budget garden, for a few years, with birch trees again. This is a fountain in winter. Um, Another garden. I start with the gardens, so I will end with uh, other project, more urban projects. Um, another garden is a, a patio garden in which uh, we sp we spent all the budget in creating a, a sandstone uh, vase made in Italy, um, with next to it uh, boxes hedges in uh, which will have the same sh a vase shape. In the meanwhile, so this garden is a still life with a gravel and sandstone, boxes, hedges. It's uh, pretty, pretty new, so that it has to grow. Uh, another garden we made uh, can be considered as the smallest forest in the world. It is a garden uh, in front of an office, which is uh, a parking lot. And uh, due to this uh, small uh, site, we had to make a very simple and small uh, identity. And uh, we had in mind a sort of razor blade illusion in which trees grow, a sort of surreal effect. The slates uh, reflect the sunshine and sometimes they turn silver or another time they are black. It's quite a nice garden. At, at night time they, uh, the trees are illuminated from underneath. Um, a garden which had been realized this summer um, and the vegetation is, uh, is very fresh and new and not uh, grown old. It's in the, the southern part of the Netherlands, which is a polar with a very heavy clay. I like that district very much because of uh, the beautiful skies. It's a very open landscape uh, in which each farm, isolated, uh, has trees to put, protect the roof uh, against the wind. Um, 
here we see the farmhouse. A friend of my bought this farm uh, farmhouse, um, and he lives here in the weekends and holidays. It's close to the Belgian border. Uh, and we created a garden, which is a very simple uh, thing. So here is the farmhouse and the house. We 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 in, insisted that the, the client uh, uh, should buy a piece of land and add it uh, to the to the to the garden here, and plant it with poplar trees, very high growing trees, protecting against the western wind from here. Then we added hedges, you, you might see them here, to make a more enclosed part with a void uh, facing the sunset and the dunes which are uh, in the west. And then uh, with uh, the, the tiles which are there, uh, used by the farmer, very big, heavy uh, uh, concrete tiles, we made a platform over here and then we ha here is the fruit garden with cherry trees and then uh, perpendicular to that there is a zone on which or in which the terrace can be moved and the funny thing or the the real uh, idea behind it is that in this area in this isolated garden uh, you could manipulate a terrace, uh, have it in front of the house, underneath the cherry trees, next to the platform, or in the cornfields, or the potato fields. Uh, and that's uh, a tremendous effect, uh, playing with the garden inside, outside. Uh, what you can see at the moment is that the hedges are very young, not higher than one meter, so they don't enclose the space entirely. Here is the platform. So this is uh, late uh, summer this year. You see that we 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 create this this all uh, secondhand material with uh, gaps in between to have a better texture. Here's the platform, a tree is uh, inside the strip. And uh, the terrace, we bought some second-hand uh, rail, uh, uh, rails in Belgium uh, to, to drive the terrace with a remote control through the garden. Here you see it. The terrace is in the platform. The cherry trees is those four. They are very small. They are more there. And here, the kitchen and the, the house. So normally, uh, the family is uh, close to the kitchen. Let's say in the morning, when, you, when they eat sandwiches and scrambled eggs. Uh, and then, during the day, when the children start playing, they move the terrace. The terrace is also some uh, metal uh, cylinders for plug-in wind windshields, canvas. Here it is. And uh, each wind direction you can change the plug-in uh, shields easily. And here the terrace is halfway, and it ends up in the potatoes. Uh, the, you have to understand when the effect the effect will be when the hedges will be grown high. Let's say uh, double human scale, three meter. The inside outside uh, effect will be tremendous. And here they drink wine and uh, enjoy the sunset. Is it uh, too quick? No? Um, the last garden I showed, and uh, we stopped gardening. Um, it's uh, uh, about gardening. You know, 
The strange thing is that uh, landscape architecture is really uh, sissy fashion, a sissy discipline. Um, I don't know why, but it's like that. Um, you know, in 19th century uh, uh, condition, which is the main uh, sentiment, the romantics, the main sentiment in the English-speaking world, um, you know, I am a Dutch landscape architect and more related to the engineering and to the waterworks than to making this kind of uh, sentimental gardens, the English gardens, references to a sort of nature look-alike or funny, funny stuff. But uh, the tradition of landscape architecture is very, very heavy, uh, fixed in this romantic uh, period. And uh, we are always asked, you know, when, when our phone calls, then there is a client who has a terrible building or a problem with the polluted soil or something really terrible. And then a landscape architect is asked to, to harm or to comfort or to make things better or whatever. That's a very strange profession and the longer I work, the more problems I have with that. You know, they always cry before they phone you, this sort of strange thing. It's, not, it's, not, it's, it's hard to get a sort of a heroic uh, uh, intervention uh, uh, made. Anyhow, this was a, 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 a headquarters, this is the headquarters of a of a bank in the Netherlands. As you might see, this is a very stupid building. <laughs> it's a building cladded with a Brazilian granite. It's done as if it's done with tiles, you know, ceramics. Uh, it's really smooth, reflecting the skies. Uh, all the too much colored granite was taken away. And the result is a, a so-called, uh, well, not successful uh, building, which was, well, the guy had been uh, in uh, Brasilia, the architect, I think. So the, the, it's a slab of 80 meters high in the city of Utrecht. There is no single building, uh, only the cathedral or higher than this. So it has no value to the city, but it's just reflecting the power of a bank company. Uh, and it re the result was a, a, a complete uh, freak out of the uh, locals, the people who live there. So the, the bank uh, uh, started being a sort of uh, politic polemic. Uh, and because the company uh, threatened the city, the municipality, that they would leave uh, the city of Utrecht if they couldn't build there, and they couldn't have a building permission. Uh, the mayor, of course, uh, gave them, but then they had to phone a landscape architect to do the balance again, the balance with nature and the balance with the people who live there, etc. And uh, that's, uh, let's say, uh, a lot of our work. It's totally shit how, it's, how it starts. Uh, because if you can make polders, then it's really ugly to make these kind of things. But, but nevertheless, we accepted the job, uh, and we were even threatened by ecological hysteria. We should make uh, a garden uh, on, based on ecological principles, so the environmental mafia in, in Holland and in Germany is taking over more and more. Uh, and, well, and, and that's, you know, that's, that, that might be uh, all the story about dealing with the environment, dealing with the local people, uh, dealing with ecology might be reasonable, but, you know, this building is it's a complete other scenario, so that's, that's strange. Um, we developed a scheme in which uh, all of the area, all of the garden is uh, uh, a forest. We asked uh, ecologists to uh, create a, a soil here in this area, a top layer, on which uh, seeds and vegetation, uh, weeds, 
can can be grown uh, in perfect balance with the uh, with the soil without human intervention uh, human intervention is not uh, allowed in ecological projects um, and uh, in this garden sorry we created a, a sunken area a sunken garden a strip this is uh, uh, about 600 feet long and uh, we we took a path from the uh, environment we and we uh, crossed the strip so uh, we we explained to the bank company that uh, a, pub a public access access to the garden uh, should be uh, uh, maybe helpful in this kind of situation and they uh, well they consider that as a positive uh, element uh, the deck the building is uh, based on a sockel uh, that's how architects a parking garage called the parking garage is underneath the building and uh, we paved the sockel with uh, uh, with tiles anthracite concrete with uh, with a, a print of birch uh, branches and uh, the, the because the birch is the tree which is surrounding the building the forest as well so as a contrast to this ever moving white silver and fluorescent green birch tree there is this this make a hell of a noise uh, there is this uh, uh, deck with the uh, anthracite fossil Um, and the, the sunken garden, we create a, a patchwork, a mosaic structure out of boxes, hedges. Uh, we went to, uh, to a mine to uh, have uh, rocks, giant rocks, and uh, 60 tons. You know, all of Holland is sediment country, so there is no single bedrock in our country. No mountain, no bedrock, only water and wetlands um, so a uh, rock is very special for us <laughs> uh, and we to to have a sort of uh, you know uh, elements in the garden when you when you walk in the garden uh, you you see the, the the building through the leaves of the uh, birch trees but also you see the the building behind those uh, strange stones which sort of uh, fight the, the, the death identity of the building. Um, at the end of the strip we created where the path uh, crosses the garden, a bridge. Uh, uh, and the, the bridge has a, a, a sort of dinosaur shape with uh, many, uh, like a skeleton. It had been transported by a red uh, truck we were very lucky because a strange figure drove to Holland. And here's the bridge. Uh, and the, you know, it comes down to the to the to the to the lower strip and is based on uh, on a rock as well, in the middle. No single uh, part of the bridge is uh, repeatable. Everything is you know completely uh, diff different. We did the whole development uh, in, in uh, models and in a computer. One part of the bridge is a bench. It's not easily to sit on all the parts. You know, you have to climb the bridge. It's not an accessible bridge. You have to really pull yourself up and, uh, or change your shoes. It might be a good, good bridge for LA, you know. This is a more physical city than the Netherlands will have ever have uh, the, and uh, the sections of the bridge are changing all the time so that make the bridge quite uh, uh, well part of the garden and also uh, a complete different culture than the building um, 
A design which, which is uh, just finished is a design in which it was a marketplace. Uh, the budget was so low that we couldn't afford making something special. At the end we uh, succeeded in uh, making uh, a design for the, the, the square is very simple in brick. Uh, making a, a special design for the electricity supply points. Um, they are artificial trees out of stainless steel. We, we started uh, modeling at the office. Here are the, the dummies. Testing them uh, how they work outside uh, with cars and with people. And at the end, uh, we construct them. Here you see there's a door uh, in it for the electricity facilities to plug in. And you see above, there are the there's the inst for, for to install it in between the market uh, uh, in the market area. You also have to deal with the wires. And they are so high, uh, that high, that that it's easy to have the wires above the lanes. They are like nipples where you put in your electricity. And especially since we work with the stainless steel, at night time they, they, they carry the atmosphere, they make the square. Okay, um, now a project which is uh, a project we are busy with uh, for six years. We started in 1990 and the, the completion will be done uh, in November with a big festival. It's the center square in Rotterdam. It's in between uh, the uh, theater and the music hall. And the, the, the place is um, quite a ruin at the moment. It is a parking garage, double layer parking garage, and a neat surface. So it's a roof uh, done in the 50s. And the city is uh, uh, for already 10 years busy to create a better uh, uh, how you say, a facade uh, around the square. Uh, we did uh, some uh, statements before we designed uh, the square. We, since uh, Rotterdam uh, is changing uh, dramatically uh, and has a skyline, a real skyline, like uh, an American city, it's a grid. Um, and in the 80s there was a booming of uh, insurance companies and banks which had their headquarters and built uh, skyscrapers. But that created a better atmosphere in the square since uh, you see a, a sort of skyline from the middle of the square. Uh, to make this statement more clear, we, uh, we created a collage in which uh, the city of Rotterdam uh, can be seen and from heaven uh, an ultra thin square is flying to that place. Um, to deal with uh, another program, because uh, the, there was a, the city was a sort of hesitating about the identity of the square, uh, a lot of trouble, uh, junkies uh, took that place. Uh, so half of the city par parliament was, uh, uh, let's say, um, in favor for an ID uh, to have the square as a sort of building site for a cinema complex. And we were uh, representing the, others, the other part of the parliament, asking for a better layout of the square, with better furniture, etc., for an empty void, a void in, this, in the city. But uh, dealing with, uh, with the situation, we create, this is the parking garage, this is the roof, we created an ultra-thin uh, layer square, which is very light because of the parking garage has a lot of problems. Uh, city, the city was thinking about removing the roof and building a new roof, but uh, by putting an ultra-thin and light floor, it was maybe not a necessity to, to create a new roof. But we, uh, as you might see here, we had the idea to put a cinema tower with small cinemas, seven cinemas on top of each other, in one, on one of the corners of the square. 
uh, that was our uh, contribution. Here we see the square. And uh, that, that would also create the first metal square in the world. Uh, well, I dreamt about, uh, uh, about lightning, you know, striking in the center of, of the city of Rotterdam in this square. Um, and here we see at night time the effect of the metal floor with the illumination underneath and the cinema complex with cinemas, you know, zigzagged. A Dutch architect called Willem Jan Neutelings tested the cinema layout and it could work with small cinemas with 120 chairs. Uh, f from the very first moment, we, uh, we emphasized that the, this, the square could only be successful if we uh, took away uh, the pavilions and the, 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 not only the dirt and the eroded uh, pavement, to have, the, let's say, the terraces in the zones uh, around the square and not on the square and to have the square as a really public domain, as a void, as a stage for the city. Uh, unfortunately, nothing happened. Two years later, MGM Cinemas from Hollywood uh, kidnapped the mayor and uh, blackmailed him. They said, well, we built an, a, a, a big cinema complex in the periphery at the highway zone or you gave us the, either you gave us the Schouwburgplein to build the cinema. And then when we, when we leave the city, the center, then forget about your nightlife. Nobody will ever go in the city downtown anymore because uh, people go by car somewhere else. And uh, so at the end, uh, the result was that MGM could build, of course, on, the, on this square. We were asked to do uh, the layout of the square and to m make a sort of realization of the surface. Uh, we had many doubts and at the end we insisted that the cinema could not be larger than this uh, and uh, positioned in a sort of diagonal on the corner. It was part of the cinema, it was, it was seven cinemas in one building. Uh, uh, one cinema was uh, 2,000 chairs big, so that was incredibly big uh, program. Uh, and uh, that design is now uh, in cons under construction. I show you again the roof uh, and the parking garage underneath. We made a new proposal with uh, a very thin floor, uh, mock-up of the materials to, to create a sort of uh, uh, mosaic uh, floor. So everything is really smooth and flat in one surface. It's really a void, but uh, we use many textures. Rubber, metal, epoxy, uh, wood. Um, as you might see, the cinema complex at the west part of the square uh, causes uh, quite, a, quite a lot of shadow in the in late afternoon. And because of that, we made a zoning in our material. I'll explain you here. This is the more shadow part to make the connection to the buildings and to the entrances of the parking garage. We used epoxy. Then this is a rubber, a warm material with wood next to it. Then all of the center is uh, metal and this part is out of granite. Uh, here is the, the model of the new uh, floor. Uh, we intended to create a square uh, which is uh, sort of changeable uh, during the day, um, not only by the light but also uh, by elements on and in the square and uh, also during the seasons and a square which can be easily transformed for activity as well. And uh, we dreamt about a more interactive uh, concept. Um, I show you the epoxy. It's a dark floor with a transparent top layer of epoxy with silver leaves as a sort of eternal uh, fall 
uh, underneath the top layer. Then the eastern part where the benches are is out of wood and rubber. The rubber is of uh, the wood is in two colors, two uh, types of uh, wood timber. Um, all of the metal part is illuminated from underneath with very easy uh, system of tubes, uh, and the 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 deck is with different sorts of perforation. So. Uh, if you walk over the square, you, you, your, your, your shape, your silhouette change. Sometimes you have dots on your legs, sometimes you look like a zebra um, or a panther. And uh, the, the night effect of the, of the metal deck is really uh, fascinating. Parts of those uh, uh, steel planks can be removed uh, and there we find electricity uh, points for a manifestation and a uh, very heavy anchored uh, uh, cylinders for even constructing uh, parts and uh, making uh, cables uh, for constructions. Uh, the night effect, we, at the moment we are testing the illumination, uh, the, the colors and uh, the amount of light underneath. There is a stream underneath the deck on, under grills, then we have six existing uh, uh, ventilation pipes. We took them down and reshaped them uh, inside a, a twice bigger uh, steel construction with fences and a clock, three of them. So one is the seconds, one is the minutes, and one is the hours. Uh, during the uh, design process, we uh, sort of transform them, them into more Picasso uh, uh, look-alike heads with noses. Um, they are, uh, I couldn't make pictures still so far, they are managing at the moment those towers. Then there is a zone, a zone f f with a water uh, attraction for children, a Norwegian uh, a granite with grills, with uh, 200 fountains. And we worked for two years uh, on the illumination scheme above the square. Uh, at the end, we had an idea of uh, using giant uh, uh, hydraulic lamps, really, really big, with feet as big as a Cadillac and a lamp which is not bigger than a fist. So it's like a dinosaur with a walnut brain and a fat body. And they move every second hour, they can take at least eight positions. So four of them, this is the research for the lamp, this is the final uh, dec decision. Uh, so they move in uh, different positions and uh, have they have a sort of powerful exp uh, expression on the square, and they even rule the space. F uh, children can add a coin, a gilder, in a machine, select uh, such a lamppost and a position as well, and then uh, they shape, uh, reshape the, the, the four hydraulics. And at night time, you can uh, spot uh, your lover on the square, with a heavy uh, beam. So this is the food. They are just uh, installed last week. Here we see how big they are. And this is the position they uh, won't have in, uh, in a month. This, because of the construction they have now, the position they are in uh, when there is a heavy wind, so this is energetic, optimum uh, configuration, then they are all horizontal. Uh, and this will be, this is a mock-up of, of the bench, so you see the bench is uh, out of wood as well, with uh, ribs and uh, feet out of stainless steel. And. Uh, that uh, will be the square uh, in late November uh, when it opens.
Uh, last year we did a, a, a show in a storefront gallery in New York. Uh, and for that uh, occasion we uh, made a paper design for a manifest for five spots in Manhattan. Uh, one of these spots was uh, uh, close to a flat iron building. Um, it's Washington Square. Uh, we made a statement uh, about uh, nature to bring the the, the square, the park, back in the grid, in the block system, and to uh, and with a, with a sort of uh, simple um, urban uh, rule or uh, a zoning, uh, a sort of specific zoning law, uh, to let it grow like the city, because the strange thing is that in New York, the city, uh, the buildings, the block are a sort of complete world of freedom and the, the, the free world of the void in between the blocks is a sort of monument, so no tree can be touched, nothing can be changed, because it's a cultural heritage or it is something. Uh, and at the end, uh, the city uh, changes uh, uh, more dramatic and has more dynamic structure than nature in between the blocks. So that was, a, that was some, something to be uh, discussed. Of course, this is all... Uh, uh, not to realize. So we had a lot of fun. We created a fully uh, structure out of green uh, and made a flat sequoia uh, twin, uh, a twin of the flat iron. And we also uh, declared why uh, the Seagram building was uh, set it back by Mies by creating a vertical park in front of it. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, the, this project resulted in an ID uh, uh, which we are building now in the Netherlands. Uh, it's a project we are busy with, so I can show you uh, nothing more than the first, uh, the first drawings, but uh, the project is accepted and we start with the tenders. So this is a square with uh, green follies where the tramway drives through. So then another project last year, uh, we were asked to do uh, an exhibition in the National Institute of Architecture in the Netherlands. Uh, and we made a statement about the uh, amount of row houses uh, to be built in the Netherlands. Uh, as you might know, the Netherlands is not uh, an area of polders and windmills and cows. That's maybe the gossip, but it's an, a sort of a copy of L.A. Uh, in the Netherlands, uh, families live not in uh, family houses, uh, let's say solitary houses, but they live in row houses. And uh, at the moment, uh, almost 50% of the polders polar area in the, in the western part of the Netherlands is already covered with these row houses. Uh, six million people live there. Um, and this is sort of strange uh, phenomenon uh, in uh, the Dutch landscape, which is absolutely uh, uh, simple to understand in an American way, but if you understand the, the richness of the underlying landscape, it's quite uh, innocent and um, it's not innocent at all. It's a sort of violent, a strange city with uh, you can doubt about the future of this city. To, uh, to show the, uh, the ambition of the Dutch, so the last uh, two years, uh, the, our government decided to do again uh, one million houses in the next 10 years. Uh, we built a model of these one million houses. We needed uh, all the street down the museum, uh, 40 students, and we uh, were busy for three weeks of sawing uh, all these houses. Um, this was a really brilliant exhibition. It was in all newspapers on every television channel, because it was, the it was also the very first time the Architect Institute 
uh, had a sort of uh, reflection in the in a public debate. Um, and uh, as you might know, uh, because you live here in LA, you see that urbanism has really no meaning. It doesn't matter how you put these houses. It's they are fine family houses, and you can put them where you want. It doesn't matter. And that's also what you see in the Netherlands. You know, they freak out on all kind of urban schemes. They write stories about it. They publish it. But when you go down the streets or fly over it, you see everywhere the same images. So it's a sort of uh, identity, a world without identity. <coughs> so this was a quite interesting research to have it seen what the effect is of one million houses. Um, and I show you this because of another project. Uh, the row house typology uh, can be done in, let's say, 30 houses per hectare. I don't know how much it is in acres, but it's limited. You, can build, you cannot build a higher density. And there is an enormous... Uh, um, well, 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 the government is craving for solutions in which you can build family house low rise because that's well important. They don't build uh, apartment towers anymore in, in the Netherlands um, to to build family houses in a higher density. And uh, we were asked to do a project in the harbor area in Amsterdam, as you might see. This is the canal area. Uh, this is the eastern harbor and the the beltway. And there are former uh, islands, industrial zone, uh, to be built. Uh, they look like this, 19th century docks with uh, a few uh, uh, stores, um, warehouses surrounding. Beautiful K structure with granite. And to, to let this uh, realized, they, uh, there, this uh, this area, they had the city had in mind to build this low-rise, high density, uh, th three times the density of the row house. So we invented a new uh, st new typology. Here we see a, a Dutch row house, a family house. People lived down uh, on the first floor, with a front garden and a back garden. Uh, and we create a typology in which they, they live on the, first floor, on the second floor. They have a roof terrace and a patio with not too much sunshine. And a, they, they store the car underneath. Uh, this is a very, uh, let's say, uh, introvert uh, typology uh, in which every family has at least a garden or a privatized area completely uh, blocked from the streets. Uh, research on the modeling. And we created a sort of uh, machine gun repetition of parcels. Here we see they are uh, 40 meter or sometimes 30 meter uh, deep, in which you can uh, develop this uh, scenario by a back to back. Uh, uh, and this was for us also a sort of uh, ID to or a positive uh, element to avoid uh, public space. As you might see, there is hardly any public space. So the, the uh, houses are really confronted when, the, when you open a door uh, uh, to, the, to the scale of the harbor landscape and to, let's say, the cosmic uh, atmosphere. And I think that's quite important. When you are there, you can sniff the, the smell of uh, diesel and uh, driftwood, wreckwood, uh, and uh, that's, that has also a sort of, well, strong uh, uh, and typical uh, identity for the area. Um, and it creates a complete new and almost hidden world of the individual inside, in patios. Uh, and, uh, and roof terraces as well, where you can uh, be confronted with uh, with always uh, windy place. Uh, the streets they are completely empty, so we leave the idea of uh, st streets with uh, 
plazas and uh, funny intermediate elements like uh, the European cities uh, sometimes have. Uh, and uh, sometimes the green, uh, green is popping out of those patios like, like the hair out of my grandfather's ears. Uh, and, and well, they, they make this tension of the individual world hidden. The, the result will be like, uh, this is a, a test in a model. And to, to have a better structure, a tissue in this uh, simple uh, layout, we asked God to send three uh, meteorites, three sculptural blocks, really big and uh, making a contrast to these small houses. When we, uh, we, we, let's say a year later, we started working with architects and uh, it was hard to explain them uh, what we wanted because well, they are really preoccupied with the city blocks. And uh, Stephen Hall was asked to do this one. And uh, well, he didn't get the point. So this first sketch was a tower. And, uh, and, and then uh, we, uh, at the end, we could explain him that we wanted not only, let's say, heavy uh, blocks, sculptural or bigger or in contrast, but we explained him we really want to have, like what, you, what they call in your country, big motherfuckers. And that was the moment that he really understood immediately the plan. And uh, his next sketch was marvelous. Uh, so our scheme, you see that the, the, those, uh, uh, those monsters face the, the landscape items, the dam and also the pump station, the sunset and entrance of a tunnel. Here we see the effect in the tissue and uh, the model. Uh, this, this uh, concept, this uh, idea had a lot of uh, positive uh, critics in Amsterdam, so they, they really wanted to build. Uh, and also because those uh, three blocks were able to make a sort of connection to the surrounding uh, 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 more heavy uh, urban layout with higher apartment blocks. It's a play of alleys, of voids, uh, of hidden worlds, of interiors. Uh, and they all, uh, well, they, they, they are built up in a sort of tension. S somehow we, uh, we could uh, refer to the uh, original Dutch cities. Here we see the 17th century paintings. You always see a horizontal uh, uh, roof landscape of small houses and one uh, cathedral. Even the city where I was born uh, had such a building. We tested a lot of, uh, in a lot of uh, models, the density and the exact number of houses. So this two and a half thousand at the end could be made. Uh, instead of uh, making a public space, we put all the money in two bridges. Uh, and the bridges are eight meter high, which is the maximum height of the low rise. So when you climb uh, the bridge, you, 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 this is the only place where you can see in the public landscape, the roofs of, of uh, all of the layout. You can watch in summit all the clouds coming out of the patios of the barbecue smoke. Um, then uh, we started to work with uh, clients and with architects and we made an uh, additional scheme to get more differentiation. Of course, you see that there is a uh, difference in, uh, in the width of the parcellation. The city uh, make, made a distinguished uh, program, so they asked for social housing uh, and free market housing as well. And we worked with different clients. And at the end, we had in mind to skip the architects uh, over different lots. So they, uh, they had to work in different conditions of social housing and private uh, 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 market, free market housing, and also in different sizes, in different sides of the islands. So we have a lot of uh, family, let's say, 
sister-brother relation or nephew-cousin building. Uh, a few buildings were done in, uh, in the typology I showed, uh, which is now in, in Holland a sort of new typology for a very high dense housing. It's in research and the, the thing I really like is that we uh, asked the, the architects to freak out on the entrances and to make the rest of the apartment as uh, simple and rough as possible to have a sort of more close architecture. This is uh, one of the extremes. It's done by Christian Rapp, a German architect, who made uh, the houses uh, here. You see, with this very small entrance, you go t through an uh, alley uh, to the patio, which is uh, not uh, with sunlight anymore, with only a skylight. And there you enter, enter your house. And uh, the, the facade to the harbor and the facade to the street is completely in brick. I like that scheme very much. Um, and we built uh, this city. Uh, this is Stephen Hall's uh, block, which is a U-shaped uh, square block, 14 floors high, high with a harbor uh, inside. We built this uh, city with, uh, with the help of a model. Uh, all the architects, uh, almost every second month, they, they bring their new stuff and they, they, they build it in sort of interaction with each other. Um, and at the end, uh, it, it turned into a sort of what's happening now, manifesto of this uh, type of housing. The last project I want to show is uh, sort of ecological project in the, in the south of the Netherlands. Uh, there was a storm disaster in 53. Um, thousands of people were drawn. And uh, the, the Dutch made a law, which is called the Delta Law, to punish the sea. And the law was that there should be a dike, here we see it, which is 15 meter above sea level so the sea could never penetrate the country anymore. But in the 70s, uh, uh, people, because of environmental uh, issues, were more concerned with nature. Uh, people understood that this is a system to ruin an estuary area, a delta, the delta of the river uh, Rhine. Uh, and they had a sort of uh, bad uh, feeling about the last dam, the last dike to be realized, this one. And uh, the, the government decided, after a big uh, public debate, to keep this area with uh, ebb and flu and to, to make an ex extreme expensive uh, open dam, which is a storm barrier with locks, doors which are always open. Only in st storm season they close. Uh, this project uh, uh, ran out of budget every year and was a, a sort of a national disaster for politicians. Many uh, ministers were sent home because, again, the project was over budget. It was a project uh, to be built in 15 years. Uh, and the last minister, minister decided not to clean up the working sites, so all the construction docks are still, at the moment, are still there. So instead of making a very elegant and simple structure in this natural uh, area, uh, in this uh, reservation, because it's a reservation now, this estuary, estuary um, it's a very strange shaped uh, island inside, in the, in the interior of the, of the system. Uh, and when you are on the island, you can you can even you cannot see the the the, the ocean. You cannot see the seals laying on the on the banks. Uh, and we were asked to our office was asked to make out of uh, construction sand. So here depots of sand were here and there, with millions of millions of tons of sand to make artificial dunes. And we couldn't do that um, to fake uh, dunescape uh, 
on such a beautiful piece of uh, engineering was for us quite unacceptable. And uh, another problem was that you even blocked the view uh, to the sea for the car driver more and more. So for that reason we, uh, we made an idea to make plateaus of sand instead of artificial dunes. Here we see a plateau which um, made a perfect condition when you drive 100 km speed per hour from below 4 underneath sea level in the polar. You're going up and climb all the way over the barrier which is 30 meter. That, that's really dramatic in the Netherlands. That's maybe the highest point in Holland. Uh, well, you, you might understand that when you dr drive that hard in your Mercedes with nice music and warm car, and then you come here at 10 meters below, above sea level, and then you have this panorama all over the sea. And then you think, wow, I'm driving over the waves. That's, that, that was our major, uh, let's say, uh, concern. Uh, to face, uh, to address, here we see it better, the, the project better to the ecological mafia, uh, we wanted to cover the, uh, the plateau with shells. Shell is a dump material, a waste, in this area because of the oyster industries. Here you see. Uh, because uh, the shells could be uh, the perfect alibi for birds to land uh, during a f flu, when the water is high, they go to the land and wait uh, for the low water. And when you have a surface covered with shells, they sit there and they make their nest in the summer. Here you see the mussels. Uh, that's how the birds fly uh, from Scandinavia to Africa sometimes. Uh, knowing that there are different species of birds, let's say white birds like seagulls and also blackbirds, oyster crackers, uh, we added two sorts of shells. White shells, cockles, very favorite shells in Belgium to eat, and the mussels, the blue uh, shells. Here we see the effect, and uh, and uh, yeah, because yeah, Darwin already uh, predicted that um, when when the water is coming up, the birds leave the the estuary and go sit down there and line up in color. So they select each bird select its own color to sit down. Thousands of birds uh, making nests in the shape we wanted them to make. <laughs> of course, uh, uh, this project uh, was, was really a, a drama and there was a lot of newspaper work uh, because uh, the mafia, the ecological mafia, uh, didn't accept this kind of tricks with nature. But <laughs> at the end, you know, the, all of the Dutch landscape is ordered in lines. The ditches are always linear, so all the frogs are in linear, and all the reeds are linear. Our antelopes, the cows, black and white, is also, you know, ordered in lines. So the Dutch man-made ecology is a sort of checkerboard. It's, it's like that. Um, here we see the effect when you drive your car. I do this quick. And you see how we could, uh, let's say, relate the citizen, citizen, the people from uh, the metropole, driving their cars with the ecology of the delta. And especially at night time, because of the illumination of car lights, the shells, they start shining like a pharaoh in his, uh, uh, in his pyramid. Um, Thank you for this lecture. Um, I was asked to uh, answer questions. 
uh, as a sort of extra service, uh, but uh, I ask you honestly, uh, it might be uh, more convenient to do this in an informal way, and nevertheless I offer you the, the, uh, the possibility to ask it here. I can see a hand. I didn't understand the question. The irrigation in the farmhouse? Uh, the, the garden with the movable terrace? Is that what you mean? Okay, difficult question. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, the question is about the birds, uh, how to deal with the bird problem uh, close to an airport. Uh, the authorities in Amsterdam uh, uh, airport also ha had this uh, problem. Uh, for that reason, I told you, uh, we worked with the National Institute of Forestry. Uh, there is a sort of scientific uh, evidence that uh, birch trees, since they have very small branches, don't attract birds, strange enough. So they don't want to sit on branches, who, you know, which all day long uh, move and, well, they, they go crazy then. So, but they, uh, this tree uh, proved to be a sort of bird resistant. And, uh, and strange enough, this is the only tree we, uh, as far as I know. So that was the, maybe one of the most important reasons to select this one. Yeah? Can we have more illumination in the audience as well? I can't see. The problem with salt water. Uh, since the Netherlands is under under the waves, we do have a tremendous problem with salt water. Uh, it's penetrating underneath the dunes, and since we pump the water out, it's getting worse and worse. So there are polders, for example, the polder uh, where the airport is related, or where situated. Uh, where uh, the, the salt water problem is that difficult that they can only uh, harvest uh, potatoes and, and other uh, vegetation hardly uh, grow there. But uh, then the, the Dutch engineers, they are, uh, oh, my grandfather was involved, I'm very proud of him. Um, the Dutch engineers uh, are busy already for a century to develop a system that they bring water from the River Rhine into canals and to uh, uh, inundate the, in the winter time the country to, to get it more uh, fresh water. Uh, and and, and th this system is, uh, well all the rivers are canalized, there are um, uh, locks in a few of them uh, to, to put the water where they want. And they are always busy uh, on the national scale with the balance of water. But that uh, won't help a few of the polders, which are too low. They have uh, salt water problems. Other questions, or do we get a beer now? <laughs> yeah? Yeah?
Yeah, those uh, sculptural identities uh, mainly have uh, uh, apartments. On lower floors they have uh, uh, studios and shops. Um, the, the, well, you have to understand the Dutch situation uh, in a way that the, the development of new housing areas is almost, let's say, 100% houses. And nobody can, can do uh, something about it. So uh, we as urban planners, we really fight this stupidity to make this monotone uh, tissues of houses because at the end to develop a better city you, you have to keep in balance uh, different programs and also different types of houses. When you only build family houses you sort of uh, send away the richer people and the poor people so you get a, at the end a not so, not so well developed society as well which is in Europe very important and I think in America it works different but uh, especially in the northern part of Europe they do a lot of uh, uh, they spend a lot of money the government to have a balance in all, all type of uh, people bringing together in one area but unfortunately it's almost 90 percent houses so we, we would have seen that those uh, uh, sculptural blocks also had uh, uh, kindergarten and schools and things like that, facilities like small theaters. But they, they, the developers don't do it. Okay, I consider this as the last question. See you in the, in the school. Thank <laughs> you.